So welcome everybody to the service dog handler chat. I'm one of the canine coaches, Penny Beeman, um, part of the crazy to calm canine coaches. And so we were supposed to have a guest speaker that here today, um, Jack Fatten was going to be talking to us about connection in distracting environments. Unfortunately, he is helping his puppers kind of heal after a rough night. So he won't be here today, but he will be here next month on the third Tuesday. And so instead of that, we're going to talk a little bit about connecting to the environment. You guys can now see my screen, correct? The connecting with the environment, and it looks like I'm sitting on the beach. And so there's a couple of different things when it comes to connecting with the environment. We want to kind of look at um, A, how we as humans connect with the environment, whatever the environment may be, and how our dogs connect with the environment. And then lastly, how that applies to the service dog world. <laughs> Daisy is such a cutie there. I like it when people's um, profiles are their dogs. At least I know the dogs well enough to know who they are. So when we look at connecting with the environment, the very first thing we're going to do is think about the location, um, the room that we are in or the outdoor space, wherever we are. Kind of look around and think about your environment. So for a moment, I'm gonna describe my environment. I am at my Uber Paws Training Center in my office. So my office is kind of fairly large and it's still somewhat empty because it's the last thing that I've like set up was setting up the new training center. So I have a big room with two desks, a nice comfy couch that I happen to be sitting on. So it's mostly white walls. I have a couple of pictures of my poppers, both Azul and Cam on the wall and a couple of Azul's friends. And I have a lot of windows, so I have a lot of natural light coming in. And I can see the front door should somebody come up to the door. It's locked at the moment because no one's supposed to be here, but I can see it if somebody does come to the door. And so if you guys kind of picture my environment or think about my environment, you'll quickly realize that like I described what I could see. And that's what we as humans tend to do when we go into an environment. You know, if I were to walk into the training center, main training room, and start describing it, I would be describing what my eyes would see. But some of the things that I left out is um, like the room is kind of cold right now. This room is furthest away from the heat source and the thermostat. And with all the windows, it gets a little bit colder than the rest of the place. And because we have active dogs moving in here quite regularly, I keep the heat set pretty low. So I did say I was on the nice comfy couch. I didn't describe that I have a nice warm blanket because my room is cold. I also didn't describe what my room smells like, which is kind of a lot of things at the moment. I would assume my nose don't work, but looking around the room, I can guess that my room smells like the chicken I had for lunch. Um, Azul has a chicken treat on my desk here. I also have a salmon treat that we made the other day. So my room smells a little bit like chicken and fish. And here comes my puppy, this doggo. He, he heard me rattle the salmon treats. Actually, he was coming before I grabbed him. But so when, as humans, anytime we go into a new environment, the first thing we do is think with our eyes. We look around and judge whether it's safe, you know, what, what kind of person do I need in the, to be in this environment? You know, do I need to be careful? Do I need to be watching for safety for me and my dog? Do I need to be, um, is it a relaxed environment where I can just be myself? Do I need to be guarded that other people are going to be trying to pet my dog? All those kinds of things that are running through our minds, we're all thinking safety for me and my dog. Right now I'm thinking treats for my dog. <laughs> and getting my hands off fishy from the salmon trees. But our dogs perceive the environment very differently. 
when they walk into a new environment, they the very first thing that hits their brain is what does this environment smell like? And that tells them a whole world of things. You know, are there a ton of people in this environment? Are there a ton of dogs in this environment? Um, what is new? What has changed since the last time I've been in that environment smell-wise? They also kind of see temperature with their noses. So um, say they're walking into a kitchen and there's a hot stove, they're gonna see that. Uh, temperature change between a warmer pavement outside and an air conditioned store, that's something they can actually see and they're gonna take note of in the first few minutes or first few seconds probably of being in an area. Depending on if the dog is comfortable in that environment or um, nervous in that environment, is going to depend on the different things that they're seeking for. Uh, but they're still going to seek first with their nose, second with their ears, they're going to be listening to. And that's kind of how they determine how many people are there is based on ears. They might also be determining, you know, say you're walking through a Home Depot or Lowe's where it's not uncommon to hear forklifts. Or at the training center, there's a business behind me that has forklifts, so it's not uncommon here as well. And so um, they're going to be, you know, gauging all that. Do I need to be watching for wheels? Do I need to be watching for, um, you know, so a lot of malls and bigger box stores have um, the floor cleaners that come in. And so by smell, they're going to know if that's out and running today and if they need to watch it because I've taught Azul to be extra careful around those, you know, not to be fearful of them, but just kind of stay away. We actually ran into one that was totally automated in a store in Illinois. So no person involved at all that we could see unless it was remote controlled and it was just working its way through the store. And so, I mean, in some situation like that, I want to be especially careful to keep my dog at a distance because that is trained to look for people and kids, I'm sure. But would it notice my dog and stop? Like if a person stepped in front of it, it automatically just stopped. But would it notice a dog stepping in front of it or too close? I don't know. I don't know who programmed it and I'm not willing to take that chance. So our dogs are kind of noticing that and anything that we've conditioned to mean something to them, they're noticing when we go in that new environment. And so whether it's an environment we've been in a million times or a brand new environment, they're going to notice those things that mean the most to them. So you can pretty much guarantee walking in the door of any facility that Azul knows if there's other dogs in that area or if there's kids with balloon animals in that area because balloons have a kind of strong smell. And that's one thing that he doesn't really like. And so he picks up on that right away. And I've had one time, like, he didn't even want to walk in the door. And I get it. It was a crazy, crazy Christmas holiday event. And we did not expect kids with balloon animals. And so they were probably on the other side of the room. But he knew they were there. And he knew he didn't want to go inside. And we had the option of staying outside. because there was activities inside and out. So, you know, we respected his wishes. He walked through inside when I really needed him to like to go get my granddaughter, but we spent the majority of our time outside because he was more comfortable. So I want you guys to take a moment and think about your environment. Does anybody want to unmute and kind of describe their environment a little bit and try to think of it from the dog's mind? Let's describe it from your dog's point of view. What are they noticing in your environment right now? Yep. Go for it, Cindy. I was going to raise my hand. Um, so I'm jumping in because I'm one of the canine coaches as well. I'm one of, I, I think Penny and I were the first partners in crime doing this. And so just, um, I'm in California, Penny's in the snowy East coast, but we have, we have deeper snow. Um, what Nick would notice first is he's, I'm laying on the couch with the dog on my feet, basically with the blanket on my lap as well and um i have another dog in the room i have my tv turned off i'm in my living room so i have i've got a couch i've got two chairs i've got an ottoman i've got a fireplace um and you know various knickknacks around and 
those are the visual things you would notice. The dog food happens to be stored in here because I live in an apartment and that's the most convenient place for me to get the dog food and being disabled. You know, we look at where we need our, um, our, what our mm -hmm. needs are. <laughs> and um, there's probably some lingering smells from breakfast because my kitchen is open to my living room. And well, apparently my Pyrenees has a very good sense of humor because, or sense of hearing, because I just put my hand in their bowl of dog. I have a treat container of dog food that I care, have every time I'm on a Zoom in case the dogs start barking. And I just rattled my fingers through the kibble and she was became activated. So I'm and um try to think what else she might smell they might smell. What are they hearing? Oh, the hearing well we're we're quiet today. We don't have jackhammering. Um they're they're probably hearing the rain um when it's going and there's supposed to be thunder this afternoon. They're hearing the Zoom, and the Zoom calls are generally a cue to, for Poe to start demand barking for cookies. Um, and Nick has gotten past that. Poe has been gone for a while and has come back. Um, so Poe has, po has another home she goes to. Um, but it's pretty, oh, then they would be hearing the ceiling fan because the ceiling fan is always running. And um, they also hear, you know, you don't want to forget, they hear the little electrical buzzes that we tend to tune out or not hear because their hearing frequencies are different than ours. We also need to take a look at um, what are they touching? Yeah. And, well, um, so the, the five senses are seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting. And tasting. And well, so what are they touching? And we didn't describe what they are tasting, but I mean, you have kibbles well, I mean, that kind of yes. tells us what they're tasting. Yes, and the, Nick's not act. Nick hasn't been activated. He's laying on a soft couch with a on a velvety blanket. And Poe got up from her bed to put her, she's doing a chin rest on me, um, which is enough to be deep pressure therapy. She's a great Pyrenees. <laughs> but, uh, I actually convinced Azul to snuggle with me by feeding him chicken. He's well, not I, a snuggler, but he snuggled in to get the chicken and then he stayed. Poe was very snuggly yesterday and Nick has been very he will not leave my side so uh, but he's on the couch which is very soft which is he's pretty much decided the end of the foot end of the couch or what what I use as the foot end of the couch by the window is his spot and then Poe takes over um, has taken over his bed okay shall we move on and so a kid and a jeep yes so it's obvious it's a farm it's obvious there's a little kid driving a Jeep, so that's extra sound and some smells. It's a battery operated one, so not a whole ton of smells coming off of it. <laughs> but there is also a four wheeler running around, which has some gasoline smell added to the area. There is um, a corn field right behind the fence. So that field contains numerous smells, including wildlife and droppings. And on the other side of that cornfield is a, another small property farm that has other dogs. And they had horses nearby on this side of the field, but they've moved them over to the other side of the property. Uh, what you can't see is the reindeer that are off yeah. to the left. And, <laughs> and kind of behind that barn is the petting zoo animals, so llamas, goats, um, donkeys, all of those types of things, the chickens, the bunnies, the pig, they're all uh, to the left of that barn. And then they also have a bunch of exotic animals like skunks and um, 
things from Australia that I couldn't name if I tried. I know Mr. Meeks is his name, but I couldn't, I never can remember what he is. He's a Janae or something similar to that. But anyway, so there's all kinds of animals, all kinds of smells, all kinds of sounds. There's a road. This particular day, and you can probably tell there's some mud puddles in the background. So that's a little bit of a rain from the day before and also a little bit of snow melt. So the ground is very, very wet. And when the ground is wet, that releases a lot more smells that our dogs will key in on. So if Azul had not been familiar with this environment, if you took a new dog to this environment, say we took Nick here, he would very, very easily be overwhelmed, overexcited, even if he loved it all, he would be so overwhelmed with all of the new sights, sounds, smells, that it would totally floor him. And I mean, not just Nick, just any dog who was had not been here before. Most dogs have not experienced reindeer up close. And so even that alone, you can smell those reindeer from about five miles away. And I swear Azul can do it from about 10. He knows when we're getting close to the farm and he'll start sitting up and looking out the window. I'm like, can you smell the reindeer? He knows them by name. But so um, Azul has been here off and on and it's my daughter's farm. So we go regularly since he was a puppy and he's been desensitized to it. But we need to kind of think about that when we're looking at our service dogs and the environments we're taking them into as to um, what senses are, might be there that we don't know, especially when we're doing a new environment or when we're doing an environment that we haven't been there often. I should have pulled up a picture of the square because uh, I don't think Jen is here today, but my friend Jen lives in Woodstock, Illinois, which is about 20 minutes away from where this farm is. And that particular town has a square where all the businesses are on the outside. And then there's like an inside green space kind of gathering area inside the square. Well, everybody and their brother walk their dog around that square. And since Azul only visits that square, maybe 10 times a year, if that, you know, it might be two times in a weekend and then not again for another couple of months. And so for Azul to go into that environment, it does totally overwhelm him just because of all the dogs that have been there in the past. They can actually smell dogs for about three weeks. So if you imagine he doesn't know any of those dogs in person other than maybe one or two of them. And there's probably 200 dogs a day. And I would dare guess about 500 different dogs throughout one week that walk there easily. And so it's instant overload to Azul. And so when we go there, we do not go there as a service dog. We go there as a pet, like all the other dogs. <laughs> and I expect his manners to maybe not be top on because we haven't thoroughly trained that environment. Are we working on it? Yes. But so Azul will 95% of the time now work wherever I need him to in just a flat collar and leash. But when we go to that particular environment, because it's extra exciting, we go back to the no pull harness that we used with him as an adolescent. And so that was kind of one of my points for today. And I know most of the people here already know about the dual clip harness and no pull harnesses and, you know, using things for safety for us and our dogs. But it's more about the, the thought of what is going to be there. What are we approaching? And so if we go to the next no, next slide, it's all about the nose, nose. <laughs> and I actually have done a lot of work on this because it's one of my big themes of the month. But the dog's nose can tell them so much more than like I can even comprehend. Your brain might be able to comprehend it more, but <laughs> my brain can only comprehend it a little bit. So not only can their nose tell who's in the environment, you know, people, dogs, other animals, who's in the environment at the moment, but also who's been in that environment in the last three weeks. But also, were they healthy, especially in dogs? Um, you know, was that dog healthy? Was that dog fearful? Was that dog nervous? Was that dog 
super confident. Um, they can tell all of that with smell. And, you know, we always joke about the dog rushing to smell the female and, you know, pulling to get to the tree to smell that female. And that's because they are trying to decide the safety of that environment based on the majority of smells they're picking up in that area. So if there's a high majority of confident dogs in that area, that dog is more likely to be confident in that area. If there's a high percentage of fearful dogs in that environment, that dog is most likely to think that there's a threat that maybe they don't know about, they haven't perceived, and they can't quite understand. So they're more likely to be more on alert, maybe not necessarily fearful if they're a very confident dog, but they're going to be more on alert, looking for, all right, what's ha what has all these other dogs so scared? And that's part of the natural dog's nose ability. And so the dogs that live out in the more rural areas are going to be more um, looking for the, you know, the wildlife kind of predator type stuff because that's what they experience and that's what they get to learn is dangerous. We have to think about so the nose knows how to do its job, but our dogs learn from their history in life as to what are the threats in their life. You know, a dog that's been run over by a shopping cart a couple of times is going to learn that things on wheels could potentially be a threat and I need to do what I can to avoid it. You know, dogs that have been attacked by other dogs, we all know well, um, they perceive other dogs as a threat quite regularly. So what they're afraid of or what they're looking for in a safety mind frame when it comes to smells is going to be based on their previous life experience and their previous emotional experience as to what they perceive are the threats in their world. So that might be different from place to place. And that's part of the reason that when we take our dog into a brand new environment, like taking the city dog to the farm or the farm dog to the city, it opens up a whole new can of worms because now they can still smell if there's fearful dogs in that area or has been fearful dogs, but they don't know what in that environment is going to trigger fear or should trigger fear. They don't know what in that environment is safe and unsafe. And so we as handlers, especially as service dog handlers, really need to support that environmental processing, especially when we're going into those new environments. And if we want our dogs to support us, we also then have to let them support themselves and we have to help them support it. So um, anyone who knows me, know I'm a big advocate of the long line sniffy walk. And I think we're gonna look at that kind of on the next slide a little bit. But whether you're using, you know, a long line to, to investigate an environment or you're doing that, you know, short line getting ready to walk into some place and you just have a limited grassy area that you're letting them explore, uh, then you really need to let the dog control the speed of that. And I know I'm really bad at that. Fingers are pointing back at me and I can put a case in point. Um, about 15 minutes before the Zoom, I got stuck on a phone call, so it was later than normal. I like to take Azul out for a sniff about and kind of leisurely walk and make sure all of his needs are met. And I typically will go out about a half an hour before Zoom or even 45 minutes before Zoom if I can and let him do all of that stuff so that he can take his time and he can enjoy it. Well, this particular time, I only had 15 minutes, which is enough for him to take care of his needs but not enough time for him to smell every bit of pea meal that's out there and smell the whole environment that he wants. And so in that particular situation, having limited time, we grabbed the leash that was going to allow him to move the most and move around the most in the area and get as many smells as possible. And when our time limit was up, I gave him his, you know, I tell him, all right, time. And then I'll start a countdown of a backwards three, two, one. And by the time we hit one, where he knows we're heading to the door. And so that's his cue to, all right, get the last of your smells, we're going. And so 
if this were a brand new environment, I would need to make sure that I allowed for even more time. This is an environment that he sniffs every day. So he knows if I cut it short this time, then I'm gonna try to make it longer next time. And the smells don't change that frequently. Yes, snows are melt or the snow is melting. So that's causing some new smells to come up, but it's not changing every day compared to if we were to go into a new environment. And so here we have kind of a slow walk rural environment video that I'm going to play. And I want you to kind of think about um, things in this. There are some handling mistakes in this video, and I, so I'm not going to point them out. You're welcome to if you want to, because I think that's good. But as you're watching the video, I'm going to try to be quiet and not talk through it. I want you to think about um, any time that you see either one of these dogs. It's going to be mostly focused on Azul, I think. But either, we have Azul on the right, Cam on the left. If their nose hits the air or hits the ground, um, try to guess what they're thinking, what they're processing in that moment, and maybe what they're trying to communicate to me at that moment, because they do try to communicate a couple of times as well. So kind of think about that. I don't think there's much sound, but if there is, I will probably mute it. So we did take this walk in November. We were on a mission to be a slow walk. So as well as on long line, Cam is on a retractable at this point, mainly because he is off leash trained, but he's starting to lose his eyesight and he hasn't learned that he can't go more than 20 feet away because that's the limit of his eyesight. He was trained at 40 feet, but at 40 feet, he can no longer see me. So... <laughs> That was kind of a good one. And we might just pause it there if I can. Whoops, that is not what I wanted, but it works. Um, so anybody wanna throw out uh, things that they noticed in that video? I can kind of replay the beginning. You saw noses hit the ground multiple times. There's also leg lift in there, marking. Right. That's what I was just going to say. What do you think about that um, leg lifting there? He what smelt he something. When he did that. He smelt something that he was leaving a message for. Mm -hmm. Could have been a fox. or Probably. A and honestly, I think we're the only dogs that walk in this area, but either him or Cam has peed on that tree before. And this well, it is, could have been a fox or a coyote. This is kind too. of their home turf. So they mark it a lot because there are coyotes that also walk in this field. And so that's their way of telling the coyotes, um, you know, hey, this is my property and we are here. And it keeps the coyotes a little bit at a distance. This technically isn't our property, but it's super close to our property. So here they actually are smelling a little bit of a bush. But there also happens to be bunny poop right by that. That particular one, Azul, is smelling a deer footprint. And you notice he liked his eyes dart over to the field because mm -hmm. he knows the direction that deer had it. And then he looks back to me kind of like, are we going in that direction in hopes? And I let him sniff a little bit to follow that trail. He does a little, another little bit of a marking. He's on the long line here. So, I mean, he's about to hit the end. So he gets a little bit of a reminder of, hey, watch what you're doing. This is part of our road to nowhere that we walk quite regularly in videos.
And so um, I imagine you guys can probably guess some other things that they sniff along the way. And sorry that Zoom keeps doing that. It's a matter of the Zoom screens and the video overlapping each other. But so does anybody have anything else they might want to add to what is in that environment based on what they saw? Or, yeah, because you didn't smell it, hear it, taste it, or touch it, so you only saw. And Cindy, you're unmuted, so I assume you have more to add. No, not really. I would just assume they were smelling fox and coyote and, you know, some predatory predatory animals as well as some prey animals um like some rabbits and um you know little furry things right and the leaves had just fallen in the trees so that helps them to smell all the birds you know we don't normally smell all the things that are up high as well and so the leaves being down adds new smell to the ground it's a little bit drier and so the dog's noses don't work necessarily as well in dry climates versus wet climates. So they might have to smell a little bit harder or want to get a little bit closer and do that deep inhale smell. Um, if you brought your dog into this environment, how do you think they would do? Would they be at home in that? Would they be comfortable? Would they be nervous? How would that impact them emotionally and arousal level based? You could tell from both of these dogs, they were very relaxed in this environment. They said this is right by our house, so they kind of consider it home turf. And so we want to think about that when we're doing, um, when we're going out on relaxing sniff walks or when we're going to a new area or maybe we're visiting somebody else. So that is not what I wanted to do. All right. So here's another one. And this is kind of putting it, some of you have already seen this video, but this is allowing, this is putting it in the public, a, public access aspect of things and like using noses and allowing that time for processing because while this is a place that we frequent often and as well as there as a, as a therapy dog quite regularly, it, the video also shows what we would do in a service dog environment when entering a building and um, kind of listening and working with the dog as a team. And so again, I'll try to mute it if there's volume. I don't know that there is. It already is muted. And so we were outside, we did our sniff about he kind of wanted to stop there. Plus we were making sure our video was going. So he was sniffing trees and getting all relaxed before walking into the environment. Very, very important. Process the outside before walking in. And make sure I have his focus before we open the door. And so you'll see I do things a little bit differently for this particular door. It's a little bit more challenging, so I allow him to go in first. I didn't have his focus, so I'm asking him to refocus by my spin, but he caught a smell that probably came off of somebody's shoes. So he needed a moment, and we took that moment. Sorry, the other videos are kind of popping up automatically. I don't have any way to do it. And so there we walk in and we're in the environment. And so it's not gonna let me pause it. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide a minute. Huh? Looks like I didn't get the video loaded for that slide, which is okay. So um, the one thing that I wanted to point out in that particular situation is that this is an environment that we are in at least twice a month, have been for, uh, I don't know, at least well over a year as well. And we're often there more than twice a month. So it's a place that Azul knows really, really well. And of course, um, he is well trained for going through the doors and things like that. But I wanted to kind of, I know we have a lot of um, service dogs in training now in the Working Paws group. And I kind of wanted to point out the fact that this is him as the fully trained and he knows what he's doing and in a familiar environment. And so think about that particular environment, that double door environment with a brand new dog, a young dog, 
And I mean, it doesn't really matter. Is he six months, 18 months old? You know, it, it doesn't matter. But the young dog that is still just learning about environments, what might they have keyed in in that particular environment that um, they may have been more aware of or more bothered by than Azul was? Any ideas, any thoughts? Do we need to go back to where we can see the environment? Because lets us see a little bit of it. Yeah, you know that airspace between the first and second doors is going to concentrate or hold smells longer than outside and inside. So anything, you know, if somebody walked through wearing a heavy perfume or hairspray, the dog is going to smell it more in that confined space than they would either in the library or outside. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, stores with, you know, stores that sell lots of perfume, like bath and body, you know, it, perfumey stuff, that they wreak havoc on the dog's nose because they're it's so overpowering. And the stores yeah. that just have that, you know, that automatic spray where it keeps the scent going. Right. The store. right. Or the perfume counter or the perfume counter at Macy's, which is known for setting off asthma attacks. Mm -hmm. So the whole goal and reason for like sharing these videos and doing this, and I am not watching time at all. <laughs> But so the whole goal of that is to think about how can we as service dog handlers better support our dogs in the environments that we're choosing to take them into in a way that increases that connection, that connection between us so that they have that way to communicate with us what they're perceiving that, you know, A, the environment is safe, A, the environment is, un or B, the environment is unsafe. A, this is going to be an overwhelming environment, so we need to take things slow. You know, that might be another thing that they might be communicating to us. Or it might be, uh, hey, something in this environment is very different than normal. And so that can be really true, especially um, holiday season when the new decorations come out. Not only do the decorations have a smell, but like Christmas time in our area anyways. Things are filled with the cinnamon, um, you know, the cinnamon sticks, the cinnamon brooms, all of that stuff. And, and pine. They're powering and surprise a dog. But also, if you think about, you know, maybe normal things, but not necessarily normal to our younger dogs yet. Um, if they had that um, floor cleaner going on the floors or if they steam cleaned the carpets the night before that's going to change the smells drastically. Um, and we talked about dogs smelling other dogs in that environment and smelling that comfort level of other dogs as well. But think about now there happens to be an influx of poorly trained dogs, whether they be pets, ESAs, service dogs that are, you know, maybe not up to standard, but there is an influx of poorly trained dogs in stores these days that is adding extra fear set in that environment. And so while we may be able to know that that dog that is extra fearful in that environment is, um, you know, we can rationalize that as, well, that's a dog that's just not trained for that environment. It doesn't mean the environment's not safe for us. The dogs necessarily don't rationalize it like that. They're like, oh, there's a dog that's fearful. Should I try to help that dog? Like Azul is actually, he works with a lot of fearful dogs. And so for him, he's kind of conditioned, like he is just so confident that they can feed off of his confidence and it doesn't really impact him. But a dog that is kind of maybe borderline, and I know Greta's not here today, but she wouldn't mind telling her story. She's got a very young adolescent dog. Um, so Cassie is had a negative experience in a store with a gentleman that was rudely rushing her and, you know, going to pet her inappropriately behind her back kind of thing and kind of scared her a little bit being young and as an adolescent. 
And so now Greta is taking things really slow in new environments to make sure that Cassie does not have a fear of men or anything like that. But so in that particular situation, knowing that she has that, if she can partner with a more confident dog that can help your dog get over it a little bit quicker. And that's where Azul has helped many dogs and why we work with many teams. But the whole goal is realizing that the dog is processing, processing that, those types of things in the environment. And so how do they communicate that back to us? How do they tell us the things that we can't see in that environment? How do they let us know that maybe there's a dog that we need to be more careful of? And yes, that's going to look different for different teams. And that's also going to look different for different things. But it's important that we as handlers are open to listening to those subtle signs. And it might just be, you know, the way they might do a particular sniff and then a check in. If it's something that is really bothering us, like say they're triggered by a certain type of person. And so um, I have a client that's working through that by teaching her dog when the dog smells or sees or hears that type of person, then the dog is to do like a nose nudge to the handler's leg to let them know, hey, we need to be on alert is all that is. And so it's that way of communication. And they've specifically developed that one to a trigger but a lot of those signals are not um, developed. A lot of them are kind of just natural teamwork stuff, which is something that we want to try to work with, which is why we play all the training games, right? It's why we do all the force-free stuff. It's why we're developing that teamwork aspect. But we have to remember that it's not just about teaching the dog to be able to work with us as a team. It also has to become about teaching us and how to work with the dog as a team. And so that was kind of my bigger presentation for the day in thinking about the environments that we're in when and how we can help connect with our dogs in those environments and use those use the environments that are around us more um, successfully. So Cindy or Ashlyn, do you have anything that you want to add? I just want to add, it's really important, especially in a new environment, to watch your dog and be aware of their stress signs and their um, anxiety signs, you know, if they're panting or drooling or we don't want it to that point. If they're not taking food, if you're using food, if they're not willing to look at you, you want to be aware of if the, if, the, if the new environment is too much and you need to back off and come in at a slower, you know, come in, don't necessarily go into the environment, but maybe start teaching that at a further distance or, you know, smaller amount of time so you don't stress your dog. Um, and I mean, just, I know that you're kind of leading toward, um, you know, this is mostly the young dogs, the service dogs in training. Yeah. Which is also super, super important for older dogs. Oh, especially yeah. When we're doing a new environment, like I really, really, I, really want to take Azul to the aquarium down by my daughter's house. And we haven't been able to do it yet because we don't really want to do it on a weekend. And I'm always there on the weekend right now. But that's going to be a totally new environment. And so oh. we're going to have to spend more time outside sniffing because. If you think of an aquarium, the dog is going to smell a lot of new things that they haven't smelled before, even before we walk in the building. So being able exactly. to. Exactly. But he's been also on. Like, sorry, I know you want something to say, but the aquarium is also like downtown Chicago, which is a totally new environment. So before we even reach the aquarium, Azul is going to be not highly stressed because he's super confident, but definitely on the excitement trail. Um, right. and, so very and aroused I, and high level of alertness and processing and, and if so i were to fly gonna have to work with that go ahead if, Cindy. I, if i were to fly in with nick he would have an airplane trip plus through at least two airports before getting to shed aquarium and exactly. you know it would be new to him i'm not sure about the odor of shed but if 
so we went to Monterey last summer for a dog show and you could, I know he could smell Cannery Row from where we were camped. There's no question. We could smell the ocean. You can smell the seaweed. There's just so many smells to that. And we didn't even get near the, we didn't even get near the restaurant or the Cannery Row at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so you need to be aware of these environments because the footing's going to be different if you go to you know if you go to say the beach and you've never been to the beach the footing's going to be different the odor's going to be different the fish are going to smell different taste different if they catch a fish um so it's things we need to we need to think about the whole environment as and also what is our dog our our personal dog what are they able to handle because different dogs are more more um, overwhelmed than other dogs, N not necessarily reactive, but more overwhelmed by the, change. What's, by the changes and by what's going on. Because, you know, if you were to take Azul to, say you took Azul to uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, you'd have the sea lions barking and the sea otters, and you'd have all the, the fish smells and you'd have kelp and he would and be had... totally aroused by all of that and he would and it's all not the, the animals be... at the farm but those are all new animals every single right. day there would be new <laughs> right whereas when i took poe to go to see the dolphins at siegfried and roy she was fascinated by the dolphins she was fascinated mm -hmm. by the big cats until the, she got charged by one but who would be too but that fascination easily leads to over arousal. Yes. And so it's something we need to pay attention to with our dogs. It, you know, so it's not just when we're, it's not just, is it too hot for the dog to be out working or too cold for the dog to be out working? It's uh, all their other senses because they're different than ours. Right. And they ha also have not only different baselines, but, um, different tolerances to different. Yes. So a dog that is used to a louder environment may not be bothered by the little noises they're hearing. And a dog that is used to a more calmer, quieter environment um, might be overwhelmed quickly by sounds. And so paying attention to that is super, super important. And we can support our dogs through that if we just slow down, if we yes, and also them, keep if we're giving them the space that they need, whether that's you know space away from other people for a period of time to like get that excitement level to come back down to an area you can work with, whether it's you know hiding in a quiet room for a little while every now and then to bring that calm back down. There are a lot of ways that we as handlers can support our dogs to make it more successful for them to be in the environments we want them in. And we also need to be aware of trigger stacking when we're in new environments because it's going to happen much quicker and it's going to be more drastic. Very much so. Anytime and, in a new environment, they're and I, when people think of trigger stacking, they usually think of things that are scary and cause reactivity. But trigger stacking doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that's scary. That's where it's most commonly used. But well, it's basically um, stacking up distractions would be another way to look at that. So right. if you have a brand new road, if you have brand new smells, if you have all kinds of new um restaurants you know maybe your dog has never experienced a mexican oh. restaurant and there's a mexican restaurant right there you know all of those things when you add them all up together it still be builds that wall of you know I, mental energy that's being used whether it's i have the perfect negative it still builds i have the perfect example of trigger stacking um the other day uh, my mom had my dog due to unforeseen circumstances and my dog gets really hyper around her dog because her dog does not know any kind of settling. It's either asleep or at a thousand miles an hour. So I go to pick him up. I go to pick up my dog and he's trying to hump my mom's dog. 
every time Rosie moved, he, she, he tried to hump her. He doesn't hump anybody else. The reason he humps my mom's dog is because that dog is so excited. So he thinks he's supposed to do the same thing with her and get excited and he can't control himself and he goes after her. Mm-hmm. And it, it, he wasn't trigger stacked. When, well, he was probably, and he, unfortunately when he got there, he was already trigger stacked because he had to leave me and he had been in an environment that was pretty scary for him. And then he had to leave me with grandma, which he doesn't do very often, or actually that was the first time. And, you know, it was one of those, and then he gets there and there's two poodles he doesn't know in addition to the doodle he does know. So it was rather wild day. Right. So, we, yeah, and so I mean, when we have something like that, and we have a big change in our daily plan or our environment or anything that can lead to, um, you know, s- something that you didn't get that you didn't plan that happened, you know, that distraction that pops up, we have to kind of watch that how many times that's happening in a period of time because any dog can be overwhelmed. I mean. Like I said earlier, Azul is one of the most confident, and I would borderline say too confident when it comes to dogs, but he can get overwhelmed just by having too many things in his day. And, you know, he has his buddy Maverick that he absolutely loves to play with, and sometimes they'll play for hours. And he had a busy day the other day, and they played for about 15 minutes, and he's like, all right, I'm tapping out, I'm done. (laughs) And so was he really trigger stacked? No. But he had had all of the changes in that day he could handle, and he really just needed to sleep. And so even though Maverick still wanted to play, giving Azul that time to take a break. And so basically, we ended up letting Azul go outside where he wanted to be and kind of just chill in the grass and watch the world go by to kind of catch his breath for a little while. But um, we we have to kind of watch for those signs and symptoms and uh, symptoms, but signals signs and signals that our dog is giving us even the subtle things of trying to put more space like Azul was definitely trying to put more space between him and Maverick and he loves Maverick and has no problem with Maverick being in his bubble but in that moment of time he just needed brain space and so thankfully I recognized that and was able to give it to him for a little while it wasn't quite long enough for Azul You know, Maverick wanted to play and we ended up encouraging Azul to come back in and play some more. But it was the idea of recognizing those signals. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today and how we can help connect with our dogs in the environments that we're taking them in. So I think we did that. I think so. And we're a little bit past our time, which I know we started late as well. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it gave you some food for thought. That was kind of my goal. Not so much a lesson per se, but just something to think about and maybe be keep in the back of our minds and be aware of as service dog handlers. I can't stop it.